Well, sup y'all, and welcome to the Food Network Part 9. And in this video, we're going to finish looking at modern agriculture and ask this essential question. What modern farming trends have been implemented and how are they organized? At multiple scales, commercial agriculture creates a significant environmental impact. Overfishing has caused many of the world's fish stocks to dwindle toward endangered levels, necessitating quotas and policing of international waters. Around 70% of the world's plants and land animals live in the forests, and with deforestation at over 28,000 square miles a year, more species are at risk now than ever before. Soil erosion is another major impact of agriculture, especially when it expands into marginal environments, such as arid regions which can accelerate desertification. Especially in some poorer countries, irrigation with brackish water can lead to the salts in the water to collect in the soil after evaporation, leading to increased salinization, which in turn kills plants and wildlife. Even in more developed countries, widespread farming practices can introduce harmful chemicals into the ground, and in some cases, into the local drinking water. As you can see in this map, a great deal of productive farmland is lost to housing and retail developments. As cities continue to expand and people's expendable wealth increases, more arable land will be converted from farmland to shops, suburbs, and other popular uses. Certainly, the negative impacts of agriculture go beyond these examples. In no way should a sane person suggest we stop agriculture altogether. It's just an acknowledgement that with any benefit, there is virtually always a cost. Many farmers have looked toward more sustainable ways of producing food for more local and national areas through organic agriculture, which is the production of crops without using synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. They strictly reduce or eliminate the use of hormones, livestock antibiotics, food additives, or GMOs. These farmers often utilize more intensive farming techniques, such as polyculture or multicropping, in which more than one type of crop is grown on a plot of arable land. Organic farming isn't always done in this way, but it is in contrast to the extensive monoculture of modern commercial farming in which one crop dominates a plot of farmland. You can see that the primary locations for organic farming in the U.S. has remained fairly consistent looking at this map from 2002 compared with this map from 2012. Despite the rising popularity of organic farming, it still only amounts to just over 4% of sales in the U.S. and a total of around $40 billion a year. And most organic sales, around 93%, take place through conventional and natural food supermarkets and chains, such as Whole Foods. The remaining 7% of U.S. organic food sales occur primarily through farmers' markets and other local venues. At the global scale, in 2015, organic farming accounted for less than 1% of the world's farmland, amounting to total sales of just over $80 billion. Looking at this cartogram, you can see higher concentrations of organic farming in places like Australia, Western Europe, and parts of South America. The push toward organic food has also paired with local food movements. A lesser used term, locavore, refers to a person who eats locally grown food whenever possible. People who choose this lifestyle are usually very health conscious and mindful of spending money more locally to support the immediate community. Many others are more liberally minded and decry the corporatist way in which food has been globalized, believing that rich countries exploit the cheap labor from poorer countries. They often promote fair trade practices, in which producers are paid higher wages than they would otherwise. That said, critics claim that these policies have little to no benefit, since it is difficult to ensure produce labeled as fair trade are actually sold to the proper markets. On the other hand, globovores, who are the majority, are people who typically buy food at major supermarkets and purchase goods coming from all reaches of their nations and throughout the world. They support free trade, believing that national and global markets create the best opportunities for the greatest number of people. Altogether, a good portion of the population is some combination of both, who enjoy the ease and accessibility of foods of all kinds from the supermarkets, but may occasionally visit a farmer's market for fresh, local produce. Due to the effects of the Green Revolution, the world produces more than enough food to feed every living person. However, malnourishment and hunger persists. The United Nations World Food Program defines hunger as possessing a diet of less than 2,100 calories per day. 
and presently, around one-seventh of the world's population is undernourished. For some perspective, a Big Mac extra value meal with fries and a Coke totals just under a thousand calories. While developed countries are certainly food rich, nevertheless, all MDCs, including the U.S., contain impoverished populations, where people do not have access to adequate food. With rising populations across the globe, combined with the loss of valuable farmland, it's no surprise that food prices have been rising for decades. Especially around lower-income areas and MDCs, food deserts occur, where people have limited access to fresh and more nutritious foods. Looking at the map on top, you see places in the U.S. where poverty rates exceed 20%. And looking at the map at the bottom, you see areas of significant food deserts. In urban environments, that means little to no fresh food is available within a mile on average. And in rural environments, that means little to no fresh food is available within 10 miles on average. And looking at a map of Florida, you can see direct connections to poverty and food deserts. This has been brought to the attention of politicians and social activists since at least the 1990s, and efforts have been made to make markets more available in these areas. To help poorer people and to combat obesity, since processed foods are energy and calorie dense, but nutrient poor. However, fresh food is also more expensive, and since lower income children are more exposed to the processed foods, they acquire more of a taste and liking to those diets as they grow up. So the markets are often not very profitable, and most food deserts persist. Another type of agriculture is communal, where holdings of several farmers are run as a joint enterprise. The best known is forced collectivism, which was commonplace in communist countries like the Soviet Union. Collective farms were ordered under Stalin starting around 1928. The intent was to increase productivity, but it had the opposite effect and led to a series of terrible famines. This was largely because of human nature. In a communist society, you are paid the same amount for the same work, regardless of effort or output. So there was a lack of incentive to work harder than the bare minimum. So people only produced enough to fill quotas, if that. China engaged in mass collectivism from 1958 up through the 1980s. The government displaced millions of rural people and forced them to live in communes made up of thousands of families, but retained no private property. The results were similar to that of the Soviet Union, and famines ensued. Farming reprivatization in both countries has occurred since the 1980s, and of course, the Soviet Union collapsed back in 1992. Today, North Korea is still a stronghold of communal agriculture, and remains the least free state in the world. As a result of their communist system, they require massive imports of grain and other foodstuffs to survive, often coming from China. What is less common is voluntary collectivism. For instance, the kibbutzim in Israel, which are collective communities traditionally based on agriculture. Kibbutzim began as utopian socialist communities. However, in recent decades, some kibbutzim have become more privatized. Comprising just under 5% of the population today, farming on these communes has been partially supplanted by other economic activities, including industrial plants and high-tech enterprises. The final trend we'll look at pertains to the Baloo Revolution, which colloquially refers to the rise in aquaculture, which is the farming of aquatic organisms in fresh water or salt water under controlled conditions. Altogether, certain types of fish, crustaceans, mollusks, and plants are farmed. Mariculture is a type of aquaculture in which the aquatic organisms are maintained in marine environments. Due to overfishing and the resulting strict fishing quotas, Aquaculture has grown substantially over the decades, and it is becoming a viable option for feeding a growing planet of almost 7.5 billion people. One thing to keep in mind is that farmed fish are usually not as nutritious as the wild-caught variety. For instance, wild salmon are very rich in healthy fish oil as compared to their farmed relatives. This is because the oils are actually due to the sardines and other fish they eat in the wild. Salmon aren't fed the same diet on farms, since that would be way too expensive. As you can see in the chart and graph, aquaculture has definitely been on the rise, with major concentrations throughout Asia and the Pacific Rim. That said, even though China accounts for more than twice the total of all other countries' outputs, they have been accused by many experts of grossly over-reporting their numbers. That is correct. <laughs>